In late 1965, small units of American special forces and indigenous mercenaries began conducting top-secret reconnaissance operations into Laos. Aimed at interdicting the Ho Chi Minh Trail logistics system, these missions were dangerous and casualties were high. In 1968, with the introduction of specially trained North Vietnamese Army hunter-killer teams, every American would be wounded and half would die. On the 27th of July, 1967, after serious infighting between the North Vietnamese Army's moderates, who favored a drawn-out approach to the war in the South, and the radicals of the National Liberation Front, who wanted to drastically escalate the conflict, the North Vietnamese Pilot Bureau adopted the Front's battle plan for the first months of 1968. Hundreds of opposing moderates were jailed, including many vocal members of the People's Army Commander, General Zapp's staff. The Front's plan was very ambitious. It called for the main force Viet Cong Army to attack over 100 South Vietnamese population centers simultaneously during the upcoming Lunar New Year Festival. It was anticipated that seeing the strength of the Viet Cong, the civilian population would patriotically rally around the National Liberation Front, demand to be united with the North, making the position of the South Vietnamese government and its American allies untenable. The Americans would later call it the Tet Offensive. Although, after the battle, the U.S. press would make much of a short-lived attack on the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, the linchpin of the offensive was to be the old imperial capital of Wei. The National Liberation Front planned to capture the city and make it their seat of government. To accomplish this, the North Vietnamese agreed to move two regiments of regular army troops from their base camp in Laos to Wei to act as a blocking force as the Viet Cong main force units attacked the city. In late August of 1967, General Zapp met with the commander of the 559th Transportation Group at his headquarters in the caves west of Zapon Laos. It, the 559th Transportation Group controlled the entire Ho Chi Minh supply complex. The North Vietnamese strategists were fully invested in the military maxim. Amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. For an operation of this magnitude, supplies would have to be secretly pre-positioned in South Vietnam. During the second half of 1967, they would move 80,000 tons of supplies and 200,000 North Vietnamese troops from the north down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to the panhandle of Laos. The first item on their agenda was the American base at Quezon. For the past two years, they had observed the complex expand from a Special Forces A camp to a significant marine combat base. With its remote but strategic location, less than 40 miles east on Route 9, both men believed its purpose could be to launch a combined arms operation of tanks, infantry, and air power west on Route 9, capturing Japon, and on to Route 23, cutting their entire supply system in Laos. With the large buildup of American troops in the south, they knew it would be difficult, if not impossible, to stop such an attack, which would set their operations back years, if not actually end the war. It was, in fact, the perceived inevitability of this attack that was the focal point of the National Liberation Front's argument for the upcoming nationwide offensive. Since March of 1967, the NVA had been pre-positioning anti-tank mines along Route 9, and reinforcing artillery positions west of Hill 881 South and north of Koh Rock Ridge to counter the expected attack, with the coming Viet Cong offensive, which both men privately believed would fail. They agreed to attack Quezon prior to the start of the offensive. The commander of the 559th expressed concerns that the movement of two regiments of troops from Base Area 611 to Base Area 607 and then on to reinforce the attack on Wei, would be discovered by the MACV Sog troops who were conducting reconnaissance patrols west of the Asha Valley, right in the path of the regiments. The coming troop movement schedule demanded that Sog reconnaissance teams be dealt with, 
General Zapp concurred and ordered the creation of a special task force. In late 1967, the initial counter-recon company was formed in Base Area 607, south of the Ashaw Valley. Battle-hardened NVA veterans from the Viet Cong Main Force served as trainers and platoon sergeants. The rest of the unit was made up of reliable three-man cells drawn from units that were reconstituting after combat operations in the South. The soldiers were told only that they would get the opportunity to kill Americans. Aside from upgrading their marksmanship skills, they spent most of their time running with full combat equipment. While the combat troops trained, engineers ran combo wire between the way stations. Kilometer markers were installed on the main trails to ensure accurate location reporting. A month later, they were deployed to the transit area west of the Asha Valley. One platoon consisting of three squads of nine men each, a platoon leader, his assistant, and a runner, totaling 30 men, were assigned to each way station. They were armed with AK-47 rifles, two RPD machine guns, and one B-40 rocket launcher. Being reassigned from Base Area 607 to a remote way station was not a job any North Vietnamese infantrymen wanted. Those of you who read my book, Dawson's War, know that I spent seven months with SOG at Mylock, which I described as resembling a well-armed homeless camp in the middle of nowhere. Mylock was a place where the NVA roamed freely. When not operating across the fence, we spent as many nights on ambush patrol as we did sleeping in a tent. Compared to Mylock, my later assignment to Command and Control North at Da Nang was a luxury beachfront resort accompanied by all the distractions a large Vietnamese city had to offer. I can assure you that a soldier's combat effectiveness is much greater when his only source of entertainment is to go out and try to shoot somebody. To coin a phrase, the North Vietnamese soldiers assigned to the counter-recon units got mylocked. Their isolation made them ready and eager to fight. Each morning, the counter-recon platoon maintained their physical endurance by running several kilometers over the steep mountain trails. They constantly patrolled the area, and most importantly, each member of the platoon became completely familiar with every terrain feature. They were told that when the Americans come, they would land high up on the mountain and work their way down, trying to find a main trail and way station. The NVA established lookout positions which allowed them to see across the ridge lines and built well camouflaged firing positions in locations where they believed the enemy would travel. Even with this preparation, the counter recon platoon's job was difficult. Although they outnumbered a SOG team by at least three to one, they were tasked with controlling 14 square miles of mountain jungle. They accomplished this by establishing fluid blocking positions between the expected landing zones and the way station. Essentially, they created a funnel effect. As the SOG unit advanced on the way station or main trail, the closer together their squads would operate, increasing the opportunity of an encounter. Each week or so, they ran a training exercise, pretending the Americans landed. Knowing the SOG teams moved very slowly off trails, the NVA depended on speed, they raced from position to position. Not having radios, they sent runners between squads giving instructions. It was grueling duty. They learned to depend on each other and became a very cohesive unit. But at the same time, their morale fell because they were isolated and the enemy never came. Finally, late one morning in early December of 1967, a runner from the lookout position raced into the way station announcing that a helicopter had landed. The soldiers on the counter-recon platoon were shocked and angered when they were told to stay in place and take up defensive positions around the way station. A company that was transiting the trail filed into camp and set up in their assigned area, which contained a kitchen and bunkers. The counter-recon platoon patrols and ambush positions were confined to an area within 500 meters of the way station. Six days later, they were told the Americans had departed the area. The transit company continued its march. 
The counter-recon platoon leader explained that it had been their standard procedure only to attack the Americans if they were about to discover a way station or supply area, and that they had been ordered not to hunt down the enemy until after the first of the year. The disgruntled platoon went back to training. In the first week of January 1968, a MACV-SUG recon team was inserted high up on the mountain near the Lao-Vietnamese border. The North Vietnamese soldiers of the counter-recon platoon were briefed. Finally, they would be allowed to fight, and they were more than ready. As they had practiced hundreds of times, the three squads headed out to their blocking positions furthest up the mountain at a double time. By late afternoon, they were in position, and three man cells were carefully patrolling lateral trails, searching for signs of the enemy. Finding nothing, they returned to their blocking positions and settled in for the night. The next morning, fearing the enemy might have slipped past them, they decided to move back down the hill to their next positions. Their movements were more cautious now, knowing the enemy may be close. By noon, they were set up. A patrol heard a single burst of gunfire. They moved up and found the body of one of their runners. They quickly redeployed exactly as they had practiced. As one squad moved back up the mountainside, they spotted the recon team and opened fire. The team disappeared into the jungle with the squad in pursuit. Moving forward, they heard but couldn't see a helicopter. The squad leader urged his men forward to attack the Americans before they could escape. It was a fatal mistake. Minigun fire raked the area. 2.75 inch rockets exploded, shattering trees. Caught without cover, four died instantly. As the jungle quieted down, two survivors moved forward. The only sign of the Americans were several ammo cans filled with sand, strewn about a small clearing. The SOG team was high above the jungle, attached to ropes suspended below two helicopters. Soon they would safely land at LZ Stud. The NVA's initial deployment of a specially trained company to counter MACV SUG's ground units was considered successful. They were able to move two regiments from Laos to Wei in time for the Tet Offensive without detection. But it came at a great cost. They knew they had been outmaneuvered by the Americans. But with experience, they would get better. Much better. Over the coming years, thousands of NVA troops would be deployed to counter SOG's operations. They drafted local tribesmen who were experienced hunters from their war crews to serve as LZ watchers and trackers. The North Vietnamese Army's implementation of dedicated counter-recon units greatly increased the risk SOG operators faced after 1967. Today, they are honored as the Tron San Commandos. It takes formidable enemies to create legendary units. There is no greater example of this from the Vietnam War than the epic encounters between the Tron San Commandos and Mac V Sog operators in the mountain jungles of Laos. But as daunting as the Tron San Commandos were, they were not the greatest threat to the men of Sog. You put some bait out there and wait for the enemy to fire on him. I'll discuss that next time. You'll find my book Dawson's War Worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac V. Sog's operations, Dawson's War is the story of five men, three Americans and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But SOG was so much more than gunfights. SOG was a brotherhood. And unless you experience the camaraderie these men shared, you really don't know SOG. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends. And like I do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer SOG's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks. And as always, like and subscribe. It helps.